now. Well, go ahead. You about to say something. No, no, no. I mean, I asked the question um, because of the very thing that you're talking about right now. I go Google search Mac Jones. I can't find anything. You say Bomani. A lot of stuff on Bomani Jones, but Mac Jones is the giant, right? And Bon, no disrespect to Bomani, he's great. No, no. When you hear when you when Bomani opens his mouth, that analysis. That's what I'm saying. Hear Mac Jones. Why, don't we, why don't we know his father first? And the work that we're doing here, the work that you have centered us on, is to remember yes. by putting these pieces into place so that we can have a system. So no longer is like, oh, we we praise these people. Somebody asked in the chat, you know, would Mary J. Blige? think the way she does if she watched one in class with car. And I was like, that's an interesting question. Uh, yes. That's an interesting question. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because it takes how many years to unlearn or, to, you know, like she's indoctrinated into this notion that I'm going to do this thing for free. I'm going to get paid to do all these other things, commercial. She's going to have wild success from doing this because the social structure definitely heaps praise upon people that uh, furthers the, the notion that they have of us anyway, right? They, they like that, which is why that halftime show looks the way it does. You know, it, it is exactly how they see us. That's right. You know, That's birth right. of a nation. But, you know, but you as know, you're talking- They never said it went to the slaves of the 4th of July. They that carried us off captive required of us a song. Shit, singing for white people has been going on since the boats pulled up. This ain't, this ain't no, this ain't no advancement, Jay. It's time to stop the kneeling shit. You better need you better pray anyway go ahead i'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, i mean and uh, more of that though because you know we're in a space right now and i'm like i ask this question every day can we blame the people who are so uh miseducated that they don't know why it's a problem to have a you know no. a video about sit sitting for two hours and being disrespected and gucci like you don't know why it's a problem to go into hermes to buy a bag and be disrespected mm. you don't know why it's a problem to to perform in this i don't think they know that there's a problem they think that they're doing something for their career, for their advancement, for black people even. I think they think they think they're doing something for us. Well, that's interesting. You know, I mentioned, uh, well, you know, it's very interesting because remember, while Du Bois is at Atlanta University doing his work, there is, and we talked about this during office hours on Monday. Again, if you all are watching this on the YouTube side later, um, again, it's just a, a reminder that the work we're doing in Nubia isn't new work. Well. Uh, let me say it. it isn't new work in the sense of the process reading thinking together everybody bringing themselves connecting what we're thinking through into collective thinking work with the, we can, which we can then take from that learning space that exchange that embongi that collective and then use to apply to the institution building work that we're doing outside of that space everybody didn't have to do everything that's why i'm saying we're working through this question of how we can you learn from du bois so in that respect, it is not new. But here's the thing that makes it, I think, a little new. That's why I paused. Souls of Black Folk, Miseducation of the Negro, selected not only because of where we are in the calendar year, we're now into uh, Negro History Week Month, Black History Month, and but selected because we'd already, as you mentioned, loaded them into narrative so with this you know you subscribe to narrative you have these including a kind of front conversation we had and then you have the electronic version so you don't have to go out and get another book is there but the thing that makes it unique i think is i'm not aware of certainly not pre-covid when the largest book clubs i'm aware of might be several hundred dealing with black books now and I see all the proliferation of these new kind of, you know, yeah, No Name is doing her reading circles, which I think is very important and remarkable, transformative. Uh, there's the well-read Black Girl platform and when the sister's doing a lot of important work. I don't, I'm I'm not aware of, in all the years that I've been aware of, participated in, been part of study circles, you know, book discussion groups, 1,300 some people reading the same book, having a conversation. And not a lecture, a conversation, which is why now it comes to the point. Monday, when we were in the second, uh, the, the second cluster of four chapters in Souls of Black Folk that we were talking about, Du Bois's time teaching in Tennessee, his analysis of the city of Atlanta, and then the larger Black Belt dealing with Georgia as his case study, uh, his whole discussion of education and institution building from 1903, uh, when Brother Garrett came in from Texas, Garrett Faria and talked about how he opens 
uh, one of the chapters with the lynching of Sam Hose in Georgia um, of the Black Belt, the Black Belt chapter, the last one we, we read when he's dealing with Georgia. And um, American Terrorism, which Garrick wrote uh, during COVID. He's a lawyer, trained lawyer. He also has a master's in African studies. He, he, he talked about that lynching in the context of the lynching of Sam Hose. And one of the things that he mentioned when Sam Hose was lynched, this black man in Georgia, which, which is, has a labor dispute, which this white boy is trying to cheat him, basically. And it ends up, you know, with his body parts chopped up in butcher's window in Atlanta. And the whites go crazy. You know, foreshadowing January 6, 2020. One uh, foreshadowing the election of 2022 and 2024, foreshadowing the race wars that are likely to break out over the next decade as this white minority rule is not stood for by those who finally understand that there's no way to placate white nationalism. You just got to strangle it in the crib. In other words, past is prelude. I'm, I'm not even afraid. I mean, at this point, we just need to be smart, not scared. But as Garrett was talking through that lynching, that Du Bois opens that chapter in the souls of black folk. He mentioned the fact that Du Bois, when he became aware of what had happened, he was on his way to the Atlanta Journal Constitution uh, with correspondence to deliver to Joel Chandler Harris, uh, the white appropriator of some of those culturally literate African morality tales, um, animal tales that were used to communicate values that Joel Chandler Harris would become, who was then working as an editor at the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Uh, would become famous for uh, absorbing and converting to what they call the Uncle Remus stories. So, you know, those stories are Africa, out of Africana ways of knowing the social structure. You know, um, consider him an early Eminem or Elvis or, well, you, 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 you entered the name of your favorite cultural appropriator that some of our uh, less educated you know, and by less educated, I mean deeply acculturated out of their own interest can seem to elevate as if they made themselves into themselves. But at any rate, Du Bois was going down there. And this is the point I'm trying to make. And this is where it comes to the question of all these entertainers and the people who don't know any better. Du Bois said, until that moment of the Atlanta race riot, when I was working down here doing these Atlanta University studies, and they lent Sam Hose and his knuckles and on display and with other body parts in this butcher shop. And I'm like, I thought the world was thinking wrong about race. I thought if we collected the data, if I sent these surveys out, some efforts of Negroes for their own social betterment to these like cities, black cities, Atlanta, uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, Clarksville, Tennessee, Galveston, Texas, Mobile, Alabama, Petersburg, Virginia, DC, and got the data back. We generate a report. We share it with these black institutions and some white ones, and we start moving together that the attitudes would begin to change. And people say, oh, okay, so we do, oh, I thought the world was thinking wrong about race. When after that ride, I thought to myself, yeah, now this ain't really a question of misinformation. This is a question of propaganda. It ain't that they thinking wrong about race. They, they're gonna do that anyway. So I think even in terms of our, our family who are gonna be, you know, uh, you know, parading across the stage for white entertainment this weekend, I think. Um, I'm always vaguely unsure when the Super Bowl is because I try very hard not to see any scores, not to see who's in it. So I guess it's coming up because he's almost unavoidable now. They're just, you know. It wouldn't change them. It wouldn't change them because it's not just a matter of I didn't know. Now it's a matter of I'm aware enough to know that I need to know more, but I got a choice to make. Do I want to be poor? Because the idea is that if you're going to buck this system, you're going to be poor. Mm -hmm. Or, and by poor, I don't mean you'll be out of doors, although that's a fear too for some people. No, it means that you won't be able to buy three Bentleys. You know, you might not be able to enter, um, enter a room in a, in a huge mansion and say, you know, Prada blouse, Gucci bra, with more jeans. Take that off. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> Give me that stuff. In a way, you can't. <laughs> that's what you want. And guess what? The people who have been miseducated think that if they can just get the right couplet of rhymes or do the right jazz, they too can get it. 
except they in the hood. They're kids at Abbott Elementary who will never get that. But they, you have them convinced because you say, I'm not a businessman. I'm a businessman. You handle my business. Damn. You know, I say, Bleak could be one hit away his whole career. As long as I'm alive, he's a millionaire. And even if I die, he's in my will somewhere. I mean, in other words, you think that that could be all of us, which means you have a fundamental misunderstanding of capitalism. But capitalism relies on you thinking that that too can be you if you just bust your ass. And so even if you are introduced to data that refutes that, we have been socialized to believe, yeah, well, that is true of everybody but me. You understand? So I don't think that information enough would change because Du Bois says it's just propaganda. But here's here's the hope, I think, and here's where it comes to, I think, what we can learn from, from, uh, from the Atlanta University studies, the format, the process, and apply in our space. Trying to replicate that methodology as, as work in our space isn't necessary in the sense that there are so many studies now, so many methodologies and so much work, good work being done by people who are subsidized by a lot of institutions. And now because of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the deaths and the uprising in the wake of those, this little guilt money that's being thrown out, this fear money, really, by some people, they're breaking off, you know, I mean, they're breaking off millions of dollars, which, in, relatively speaking, is like they're breaking off, you know, a nice little fistful of crumbs to HBCUs to start these little kind of, uh, what should I call them, stump or stub initiatives. Here's, here's a million and a half. Here's four and a half million. Here's six million to distribute among eight HBCs. One of y'all taking the lead. And we're going to study housing. We're going to study wealth. We're going to study entrepreneurship. We're going to study. Okay, those aren't the Atlanta University studies. But it's enough money for well-meaning and determined scholars to generate data. So we don't have to do that in a place like Nubia or narrative. We don't have to do that. But what we can do, and this is where the deliberate effort comes in, we can curate data, think through it together, and then figure out how can this new insight be used to do two things, continue to enhance and build this network, this information network. And this is where we're talking about building collectively and connecting. And the other thing is, how can that building together and collecting that we do here then connect to all those places that we see every Monday night in office hours, everybody in bringing their brick, they're bringing everybody else that's in those networks they're connected to. And so, and I'll, and I'll use a very specific example from yesterday. I was out because the world yeah, is opening back up in some ways and uh, had some um, colleagues in town from Philadelphia and they had asked me to meet them down at the National Museum of African American History and Culture to, you know, walk their students through from uh, Cabrini uh, University in Philly and came down and said, you know, well, you know, would you meet us? And I have, again, this has all been experiment experimental. It's been a hundred weeks we've been doing this. When we started, as you say, can I press record as brilliantly last week? We did them four hours, which, you know, is a record we would not approach again. No, no but, uh, but not because it wasn't great, but because, you know, that was, that was a unique moment, right? But in that process, over the arc of these last two years, we've been, you know, experimenting with how to build collectively, how to connect. Um, two years ago, when we were before COVID, we're entering in a minute the month of March, where this whole thing went that way, you know, the commutes were killing us differently. You know, the, the students, if we're teachers, you know, you and I are teachers and all of our teaching colleagues, it's a different kind of rhythm. And when they shut down the world on a dime, you know, my first thought was it's time to jailbreak it because it's not enough to be in these little places. And we've been able to do a lot of that. So yesterday I'm down there. So I'll go, I'll go down, I'll meet y'all down there in the afternoon. Because one of the things I've been experimenting with, I had an interview yesterday with, uh, was it yesterday? Oh, we did a roundtable on the Supreme Court picks coming up. Because again, a lot of misinformation about that. So we did that. And then, um, I said, so I can go in, I'm coming in the afternoon, met him down there and spent 
hours with them, you know, basically to the place closed, right? Going through things, you know, asking, answering questions, pointing out things in the museum. And I saw a couple from Virginia. Now, of course, we're masked up. So, but as I'm sure happens to you a lot, because there are millions who know you now, of course, over these last couple of years, even more with the visual. But before that, even now, many, 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 many more by your voice. So as I'm talking, you know, Dr. Carr, hmm? I thought that was you. Why? I heard your voice. Those four words. I heard your voice. Even before COVID. I know I'm loud. <laughs> and then I laugh for something. That's Dr. Carr. What? what? Yes. So anyway, a couple from Virginia, uh, school teachers, uh, daughters and administrator at a university in Virginia, talking about the impact of this space on the practices that they engage in as educators. And we got in this whole conversation because their daughter works in financial aid, talking about how black students don't get enough information and how to deal with financial aid and how she's trying to school them and lecture them because the school she works at is $80,000 a year. And children say it was a flagship school. I wanted to go here since I was a kid. And she's like, yeah, you can get the same education these other places. And they only give out need-based aid. And your family makes just enough not to qualify for the most. And even if they get half of that, that's still 40 stacks. What you going to do? And so she said, she said, I wish we had a network to. I said, well, that's what this is. In other words, we're not trying to go into the business of rewriting how people think about financial aid. But in this space, what we can do is when you enter this space and we break data points in and connect it to the momentum of memory, you can then go out and transform that space with your network and then bring that back into the conversation as a best practice. We can leverage that work. And it was very interesting because the conversation turned very quickly as we were talking, standing there talking, turned to critical race theory and what's going on in Virginia. Because, of course, we know now that the white nationalists have taken back the governor's office and the lieutenant governor's office, proving once again that white nationalism doesn't have can also come in blackface. You know, they got this whole tip line now of critical race theory is, you know, coming. And, you know, if you see critical race theory in your, in your child's school, you can call this tip line. And I said, I embrace that with both arms. What do you mean? I said, that law passes. Yeah. The next day. Yeah. Everybody should call the tip line and say, yeah, listen, my child came home and said that in her class, they said that Christopher Columbus discovered America. I, my child was traumatized by this racist interpretation. In other words, see, we thinking about this wrong. Come on. They do what they're going to do. And then we then had about a 10 minute conversation on how to do that. And how would that relate to Nubia and how it would come? Very simple. We got a lot of elders in Nubia. We got a lot of children in Nubia. I said, I told him yesterday, I said, imagine this. Y'all in Virginia. And you got, you talk to all the churches. You talk not only to the organizations, the AME, AME Zion, the CME, the Pentecostals, all you to get get to, get to get to the leadership, but then go to the churches and say, look, we want everybody, but we're gonna start with the Missionary Society and Mother's Board. And we want the elders to set up a phone tree. So the day this law passes, the next day, we want y'all to come. And I said, imagine this. Nana sitting on her couch watching her stories on the phone. Hello, yes. My grandbaby came home and said something about Brown versus Board of Education and said it was a setback. She was traumatized. Click. Nana, wait 10 minutes. Hello? Yeah, my grandbaby came home. <laughs> Do y'all understand that there are people in our community that all you have to do is introduce that idea and they say, oh, we got it. Because see, what you never want to piss off is old black women. <laughs> Can you imagine those grandmothers? Okay, y'all job in Virginia is to bust out the critical race theory line. Oh, no problem. I got 10 grandkids and I know where they all go to school. I'm getting ready to call and I'm going to lay it out. And then you got people, and then the children. See, y'all think, see, here's what you're going to stand by white nationalism. It's got all the muscle in the world till you punch it in the face. That's when you find out out of a million of them, it ain't but eight of them doing it. The rest of them people ain't trying to work that hard. You, on the other hand, are battle tested. I said, we've seen this show before. I said, I said, Virginia was the home of Spotswood Robinson and Oliver Hill. The it was the home of Barbara Johns when they walked out of high school. You know, Vernon Johns' niece, 
who was down, of course, in uh in, in, in Dexter Avenue Baptist Church before Martin Luther King. I said they argued cases before straight races and they won. How do you do that? You said, if you're going to put me out of here, you're going to have to tear up your own law books. And either way, I'm cool either way, because either way I win. I said, but that requires networks. And I'm saying what we're building now can allow people, once they get that, we don't worry about Super Bowl performances. We too busy lining up the Missionary Society, the Mother's Board, the Fraternity and Sororities to start the CRT calls in Virginia. So the, we don't need to collect data. Although what we can do and learn from Du Bois is if there are specific questions we want answered, and we do this every Monday night, we can take polls from people's experiences. I mean, we're not talking about, if we were talking about 200 people, it would be, because it's global. You know, as we as we saw last week at the hundred, we got ads in them. We got people in the continent of Africa. We got people in the Caribbean. We got said in them in Latin America and Brazil. We got people all over. If we just had two hundred, a snap poll of two hundred, with that with a feature that could be easily added because we already got the chat and people are coming in, dropping in resources, putting their experiences in, connecting with each other, and then every week there's another cluster that develops with an idea. I mean, that teacher's lounge idea that came out about a month ago, we were in so uh, in, a, in, in, in miseducation. The Negro was brilliant. Educators starting with the sister in Florida. Educators from all over the world now with a space in Nubia where they can compare no trade curriculum ideas. And so you're not paying Johns Hopkins. You're not paying Harvard. You're not paying Howard. You're not paying any of these institutions who are waiting for a grant or waiting for a sabbatical or who thinking we gotta do, no, 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 no. The teachers are talking to each other and they've already developed lesson plans and they already know this resource network of folk and they're already connected to the black booksellers that are already posted in narrative and already part of the network. What they're doing now is building without the distraction of all that noise from the social structure that tells you it's gotta come from the foundations. It's gotta come from the universities. No, we jailbroke that. And so I'm saying, what we can learn from Du Bois is, as, we, as we're looking at the data from these various places on these subjects we will identify, we then say there's a gap here. There's a question that they didn't ask. Well, then let's ask the question of ourselves. And we're not talking about 200 people. We're not talking about 500 people. We're not talking about 750 people. We're not talking about 1,000 people. We're talking about 1,300 and building every Monday night, just in office hours. And that's not everybody in there. In other words, we have now, thanks to you, established a beachhead for connecting, for creating control. And that looks more like 1897 than 2022. Mm. And see, in that respect, and this is why I'll end with this just for a second, and we'll talk about Alice Woodland for a second, because a lot is ties to her life. COVID gave us, as we talked about last week, a, a, a large captive audience. We know that it's going to melt. You know that better than I do. I mean, you this is you know one of the many things you had to master because you understand how, how all that stuff works and inter interacts. How do you get people's ears and eyes before something? Because even yesterday when we were talking, um, you know, were some things they weren't aware of. And I'm thinking, okay, well, how do we get you involved? How do we get you or make you aware? And I think at that point, somebody like a Mary J. Blige or or you name the person, once they become aware. Yeah, they might. Oh, well, that's interesting. Let me watch that again. Or let me share that with somebody. And that's when we start talking about platform, right? Now, the question, different question is, how do we build sustainable, solid movements? Because a captive audience is one thing. Masterclass has put all this money into this Black love thing that they did this, this month. God bless them. You know, God bless our friends who went and did that. Why? That's platform. Right. I mean, we see, you know, we talked about Kamal Bell for a minute. God bless him. Why? That's platform. Now, you know, CNN got a bigger, larger reach. But the question is, does that translate into movements? No, it doesn't. It just translates into into eyeballs. Now, what you going to do with it? Nothing. It's branding. It don't mean nothing. Now, how do we influence policy? Well, there are two tracks in policy. Policy influence comes from organization and putting pressure on folk. So when you say Oscars so white and a hashtag, 
and you combine that with a threat of a racial uprising, they may give out three more Oscars than they were going to give. We passed it. Cool. So this year they go back to what they was doing. Haven't done much. In fact, you really haven't done anything because it's still their statue. Now, the other element of influence that will require a deep shift, that's the hard work of organizing in a space that you control, that you own, that where you're building collectively, where you're connecting. And that has the that has the impact long range of changing behavior. I'll give you a very quick example. This is the last one I said in the last category. I'm going to come to Alice Window. Kwanzaa may seem like a small thing. But anytime you can walk into Walmart, Target, anytime you can walk into all these places, just like they selling Rosa Parks baby dolls, I say baby doll, Rosa Parks dolls at Mattel, and they selling Maya Angelou dolls, and they selling, you know, Ida B. Wells dolls at Mattel. They're not doing that because they all of a sudden got pro-black, or they hired three black people in a diversity unit. They're doing that because they can read the numbers. And that shift, that black consciousness shift, has occurred over the last couple of generations in primary part because of the black power movement of the 60s and even something like Kwanzaa, the organization that gave the world Kwanzaa, which is a remix of various Africana ways of knowing and cultural meaning making and movement and memory, and then a gloss that brings it into this moment, useful, that organization is tiny. What they did, however, was connect to people who weren't in the organization, but who were searching. So what you what do you do? You put on programs. And who's at the program? Some of these school teachers. Then they take the stuff back to the schools. Then the children take it back to the house. Then you put on concerts. Then you put on, you know, programs. And those people take it back to the community. Here we are almost 60 years later. And the social structure, realizing they couldn't kill it, decide they want to join it. Let's get a Kwanzaa stamp. Oh, okay. Let's get all this uh, Kwanzaa uh, gift paper and Kente print. And so, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Now, that has two consequences. One, it allows capitalism to attempt to co-op the thrust. But the other challenge, and this isn't all good or bad. It's, I'm just talking about influence at this point. It runs the risk of what Paulo Freire and others have called the surplus value of knowledge. You think NBA because you now have a NBA HBCU classic game where your designers put together a fake HBCU logo and above it, it says N NBA and HBCU. And, be and between that, you got red, black, and green that made me wince when I saw it. Like red, black, and green is because of the liberation flag. There are no HBCUs with red, black, and green in there colors. Certainly not Howard, whose colors are red, white, and blue for a deliberate gesture toward patriotism. They ain't gonna have no red, black, and green. But you realize, I said, let me think about this though. Would I rather not have red, black, and green in there or have red, black, and green in there? It's still an open question for me. For me, as a person, I never want to see red, black, and green associated with the social structure, because it ain't. But for me, as an educator, I understand that the surplus value of knowledge theory means that somebody looking at that is thinking, yeah, it ain't good enough to go play in the league no more. I want to own a team because red, black, and green, Marcus Garvey said, you got to own. See, y'all wasn't intending that. <laughs> but that's because small groups didn't try to recruit everybody into the group. They kept their thing tight, grew it slowly and solidly, and then used that to connect. And in some ways, I think that's what we're doing. And as far as that's concerned, we're ahead of schedule. 